The Crusader Kings franchise has been a huge inspiration for me over the years, if not an inspiration for the entire channel's existence. And had I not taken a step back from YouTube before CK3 launched in September of 2020, we might have been playing it this whole time. Crusader Kings 3, however, has never been on the channel until now. I've been teasing its introduction for a few months. Today, I'm done teasing. Hello, Legion. This is Hadrian. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the Empire of Albion series in Paradox Interactive's Crusader Kings 3. As you might expect, I'm going to lay out the series real quick, and then we'll play. And we're going to go with an early start as the tribal kingdom of Alba, which you might call the geographical precursor to Scotland. Real quick, one thing that has surprised me is that you don't see many videos like this that actually introduce the game. Maybe that's because to some audiences, Crusader Kings needs no introduction. But if you're not familiar with Crusader Kings 3, this is essentially a historical sandbox with just an absurd amount of nuance. In CK3, you play as ruler of a chosen portion of the map and can start at the outset of a handful of historical eras, playing as literally any landholding character in the game, be they a baron, a count, a duke, a king, or even an emperor. Three key differences set Crusader Kings apart from its contemporaries, even from Stellaris, which I've done a series or two in already. There are no set victory conditions. Number one, you decide what winning means. Number two, dynastic expansion, not territorial, is the main focus of the gameplay. And three, you play first and foremost as characters within families, not as nations upon maps. So those of you who have been around the channel for a while, and you know how important story is to me, this is a game that's all about emergent stories and stories that can be different every time. And this is going to be a comparison that might throw some people for a loop, looking at the kind of game this appears to be so far, if you're not familiar. The amount of overlap between CK3 and the basic gameplay meta of The Sims franchise might surprise some of you. And no, I'm not just talking about the horrible things you definitely don't do to your Sims when no one's looking. Anyway, with this, our first CK3 series on the channel, our near-term objectives are going to be to establish a dynasty and preside over the formation of the Kingdom of Scotland, hopefully converting to feudalism and true Scottish culture along the way and probably while resisting multiple onslaughts from the Northmen over the years. In the far term, our goal is to establish dominion over the entirety of what we now call Ireland and Great Britain, reclaiming Britannia for Alba and renaming it Albion, in honor of the ancient Celtic name for the British Isles. I have definitely gotten my hands dirty and played this start multiple times over the last couple of years. I haven't completed all of the steps I'm aiming to complete in this series before, so to some extent this is a blind playthrough. One thing I can say for sure, much like an interloper start in the long dark, Alba's start is chaotic and unpredictable. So I have tried to roll a starting character with an advantageous personality, and what I'm really going to need from you as viewers is the ability to restart the game within the series if things get out of control. The sharing of tips and advice in the comments is totally welcome as well. It's always been really helpful in grand strategy games in particular for me, and especially for viewers who are learning grand strategy games like Crusader Kings 3 for the first time, it can be really useful to kind of mine the comments for information. So as long as any advice is focused on sharing knowledge, giving me options, or explaining mechanics, that would be great. Comments that directly or indirectly suggest what I should do or shouldn't have done are not as likely to be helpful. Now, having said that, I think I have teased the start of this series enough, not only over the past couple of months, but just over the first few minutes of this episode. So let's jump into some gameplay. And by jump into some gameplay, to be very clear, what I mean is let's probably spend the remainder of the premiere and first episode going through a series of actions that I pretty much have to go through if I really want to set myself up for success over the course of this campaign. So before I get into the specifics of like what we're looking at and who we're playing as, King Constantine the second McKinnade of Alba, who's 25, if you haven't noticed. Let's just zoom out for a second and appreciate the stage on which this particular tale is set. This is CK3's map. <laughs> just let that sink in for a minute. We've got Iceland up here, and of course, Ireland, Alba, soon to be Scotland, British Isles, Europe. There's Constantinople. Wait, did I just see? Nice. Hagia Sophia. And over here we have the very far western borders of China. And if we actually look at the empire map to show the empires that by right should exist, they don't necessarily exist right now, which is a whole topic I'm going to get into later. <laughs> Tibet. So on the far eastern side of this map, we have Tibet. We're over here on the western side. And we are playing as the Kingdom of Alba. Again, objective being to become the Kingdom of Scotland 
and eventually to rule the Empire of Britannia. And we're going to call it Albion, not Britannia, when it happens, because Britannia is the name the Romans gave this particular province of Europe. But the Celtic name was Albion, which I believe is where Fable got it, by the way, in case you're wondering about that connection there. So before I go down any rabbit holes, because it is so easy, I've actually attempted the beginning of this recording multiple times, and I just rabbit hole in different directions, because there are so many interesting mechanics to explain, and it's genuinely difficult to decide which one to kind of start with first. So we're going to go through in relative order in terms of some of the things the game is telling me to do, and then I'll talk about some of the higher order decisions that need to be made. And I will do my best, by the way, since many of you watching this are longtime viewers of the channel, but you might not be familiar with CK3, might not have seen this before. I'm going to do my best to explain what I'm doing as I do it so that you can have some context for my decisions. So first and foremost, we need to find a spouse for Constantine the First. This is Constantine the Second, McKinney of Alba, but he's known in the Scottish line of monarchs as Constantine the first. And what's interesting about this, again, Paradox goes for like as much historical accuracy as they can within reason and within budget, I suppose. So when you look at, don't quite have the tooltip pulled up, there it is. When you look at his birthday there, if you actually look at when Constantine the first was born, he was actually born about five or six years earlier. But this is who was ruling the Kingdom of Alba at this particular time in history even if his birth date's not quite right. So we've got an approximation of this person, and the name is correct, and we're going to start off as that character. But then after that point, uh, <laughs> it's anything goes. This can go in any number of different directions, you know, that are different from the way the world actually played out, which is what makes CK3 such a fascinating game to play, and among many, many, many other things. So... Constantine the second is arbitrary. By the way, he is always arbitrary. That is a permanent personality trait that he will have every single time you choose this start and choose to play as the Kingdom of Alba. You will play as Constantine the first or Constantine the second, but he will always be arbitrary. But then he's arrogant and he's diligent. So these are the traits that randomly rolled in order to give me kind of a preferable start. Diligent is a pretty good trait to have to kick off and arrogant has its benefits it also has its uh downsides but we will talk about that later just want to introduce him as a person he's also an amateurish plotter so his education level is that he is somewhat skilled in intrigue to the point that he is considered an amateurish plotter keeping it interesting he goes both ways in the bedroom too let's go ahead and find him a spouse now in order for this to start well we need to ensure that our marriage is going to secure some kind of alliance. So let's sort by alliance power and notice that the person at the top didn't change. Now, fun fact, fourth wall break, if you will. When I was planning this series and when I was trying to get this start sort of ready, I rolled multiple, shall we say, incarnations of Calcentine the Second because, again, this is a very chaotic start and you need certain variables to kind of be in place in order for things to progress normally and you know for you to have any chance of survival against some of the things that can happen it's not that the kingdom of alba won't survive but this character's line can struggle depending on how things play out and between the two choices that i kind of came down to i had two saves that i wanted to start this series with and i decided to go with this one because we have Princess Ermintrude here of West Francia, who's always at the top of this list. She's the elder daughter of King Charles II of France. She's 17, which in CK3 terms is marriage age. And so we can secure an alliance with, and you can see he's got almost 5,000 troops that would be able to come to our aid in a war if we summoned him, if we were to marry his daughter. So Princess Ermintrude of West Francia is going to be our choice of spouse. But interestingly, in this kind of version of history, in this random role, she's lustful. <laughs> so let me just start right off. I'm going to go down this rabbit hole for a second because it's worth it. So why choose that trait, Hadrian? What's, what's going on there? Explain your reasoning. Well, I will explain it. So again, we're starting off a dynasty, right? This is the beginning of the game. One of the first objectives you should pursue in any game of CK3 is to have 
a family that spans far and wide and that is influential and that is generally just vast and unconquerable. So in order to really get off to a good start, you need to have a lot of babies. And it's useful, as you can see from the fertility bonus and the tooltip for Lustful, it's useful <laughs> if one or both of the characters in a marriage are lustful. And of course, it doesn't have to be in a marriage either. Let's be real. Things get complicated from time to time. Speaking of which, the downside of this, but also an upside for the series, the reason I decided to go with this start is actually this version of Ermintrude. Not just because it might help us start off the dynasty, because uh, Constantine the First or Constantine the Second and Ermintrude will have more babies, but... It also means potentially more drama, because the princess, soon to be queen, might just decide that the king is not enough for her and could run around and cause problems. So there's the, just a teaser of something that could unfold. Might not happen. Might not. You never know. Personality kind of plays out differently. She is an honorable character. She's an honorable empath. So basically, if you look at how the game will try to play her, you can look at this tooltip for any personality type in the game and get a sense for how that character is going to act, roughly speaking. But who knows? We'll have to see how it plays out. I just thought that that would be, yes, helpful from a gameplay perspective, but also, just to be real, I thought it would be entertaining. <laughs> just sheerly entertaining from a gameplay perspective as well uh, to have that potential for drama from the get-go. So we're going to send this proposal, and we're not going to unpause yet, so it's going to be a second before we can actually address that. But next, let's go ahead and choose a lifestyle. Those of you who are RPG fans, like me, will love this part. So in CK3, there are skill trees that are around the five core traits, which, by the way, are diplomacy, martial, stewardship, intrigue, and learning. You can see the king's value for these traits, not particularly high, by the way. Ideally, you want all of these to be like approaching 20 or even higher than 20 by the time you're in a very established kingdom or empire later in the game. But it's the start, so most of his <laughs> most of his traits are just barely crossing the double digit mark, unfortunately. And you can choose any of these lifestyles and gain experience as time kind of plays out and the experience can go into perks. So if we choose the learning lifestyle, which we will do, we're going to select a particular focus which gives us certain benefits. We're going to go for the scholarship focus to kick things off. Why? Because development growth will be improved if I choose scholarship. As long as this is his focus, I can change it later in his life. But for now, I want to go down these skill trees that you can see here, one of them at a time, obviously. And I want to have scholarship as the focus. Since I'm going to be on this page on one of these trees, I have to choose one of these focuses. Scholarship is the one that I would like to go with for the sake of having more development. I'll explain what development is once we get to that point. But that is that. So we've chosen an educational focus for him. Now we need to nominate a successor. This is due to our particular succession style in the Kingdom of Alba. So Realm Succession Law is Confederate Partition, which it's not particularly fun to deal with Confederate Partition. Partition is preferable. Ideally, we would have something like High Partition, which means the lion's share of titles will go to the player heir. The rest will be divided between your children. Confederate Partition is problematic for reasons that really don't make sense to explain in the very first episode of the very first time I've played this on my channel. But just generally speaking, it's bad. I'll say that. But the way that we currently have things set up under succession and the way that things are currently set up under gender law, we vote for who we think the title heir should be. So we're going to cast a vote for Donald McCausentine, who is our historical, that that child literally existed. And this king, he will in, in actual history become the king of Alba after Constantine the first. We're going to vote for him to be our heir. Now, that doesn't mean he necessarily will become the heir, but that is what we're going to do. Next, dynasty legacy. So we've just started our dynasty, and by virtue of that, since we're just getting started, the game is letting us choose one bonus to kind of 
have a perk of some kind. I'm going to choose Noble Veins. There are tons of options here, which as you can see can boost things in, can boost outcomes in customs, activities, warfare, law, guile, blood, erudition, glory, kin. So for example, I could choose Bounteous Loins, which would improve fertility. Who would get improved fertility? Every single member of the dynasty. Not just me. Every single member of my particular dynasty would get an improved fertility uh, rating by 10%. I could go with that, but what I'm actually going to go with is Noble Veins. So notice that when I choose Noble Veins, the chance of inheriting good congenital traits is going to increase, and the chance of new good congenital traits will also increase. So you can either inherit good ones that the characters that are parenting a new character already have, or there's just the chance that a new one will pop up, and both of those chances are improved by 30% if you choose Noble Veins. Again, we're at the start of a dynasty. I want to have as many of those positive traits as possible. Right now, do I have any traits? I have exactly zero traits. Traits are... Hang on, let's see if any characters in my... Mm -mm. And this is fairly typical for a start in CK3. There aren't that many characters that are at least immediately accessible to me that have really nice traits. If we go to, say, an existing, an existing empire, Basileos has a couple of traits. So Basileos is comely, which means he's pleasant to look at. He's a handsome guy, and he's strong. Now, this is not a congenital trait. Comely is, however. So there's always a chance that his children will also have this trait. There are higher levels of this trait, the highest of which is, of course, beautiful. So you've got this fully bloomed rose there as, a place, as opposed to just a rose bud in that icon. Anyway, again, rabbit holes. So much to talk about. Now, these last few icons here, these are just available activities. I'm not going to worry about this too much, but let's pause for just a moment and now kind of look at some activities that are outside of just this list of notifications. I'll come back to holding court a little bit later on, possibly towards the end of the episode. The next thing we need to do is station our men-at-arms. This is a fairly recent addition to Crusader Kings 3. It wasn't there when the game first launched, but basically you can station your regiments of men-at-arms in particular holdings to improve their training based on the buildings and the terrain types present, etc. Interesting that we have three men-at-arms regiments off the bat. This is also somewhat randomized. So the men-at-arms, the armored footmen that we have, the archers that we have, and the pikemen that we have. Interestingly enough, I don't always see three separate types of units available in the beginning men-at-arms. So that might have some bonuses as well as some downsides but that's just another objective to kind of cross off the list <laughs> we have too few concubines because right now under Gaelic culture concubines are a thing characters can only have one spouse however rulers if allowed by gender law can have up to three concubines so that's fun what we're going to go with, let's see. Now we do have a negative congenital trait here, which is slow. You would see that actually negatively impacts all five core stats and reduces the amount of experience you gain in lifestyle, which we looked at a moment ago, for any character that inherits the slow congenital trait. So that's a little bit of a risk. And for that reason, I don't know if I like that since we're at the start of a dynasty and that particular relationship could yield children. So let's instead go with Eleonora. She doesn't actually have any negative traits. She's 25, I believe. Yeah, same age as the king. And we have another lustful concubine, which... Uh, okay, this is going to be interesting. Going to be lots of babies, at least. But could have problems, you know, as far as people sleeping around and things that can happen when people sleep around. So um, that's a bridge that we'll cross when we come to it. So next, yeah, we can offer hostages. We're not going to do that right now. There's an active election. Let's go ahead and negotiate an alliance with our brother, who's our spy master. And that's pretty much the next big topic, I think, is covering the council and what that means for the game. It's also a good kind of 
moment to pause and breathe because there's so much, even if you're just following along thinking, what the heck is happening in this? If you've watched me play Stellaris, but you're not particularly familiar with CK3, there's going to be a lot that kind of seems vaguely familiar. I mean, it runs on the same engine as Stellaris. Stellaris kind of goes in a very different direction and it uses kind of a top-down view of space, but it's still obviously meant to be kind of map-based gameplay, even in Stellaris, and it's just interpreted in a different way. CK3's major difference is, of course, that there are characters that are connected to virtually every function in the game, and you can interact with the characters, and your relationship with the characters you're interacting with can either benefit or harm your intended goals and your progress towards whatever it is you're trying to achieve with your playthrough. So it's a sandbox in the truest sense of the word, and a lot of the fun of CK3 just comes from enjoying the ride, so to speak. So our brother is High Chieftain Aid McKinnade of Moray. He's 23, so little brother, two years younger than me. He's also a spy master. He's also diligent, but he's humble. So he's a content blackguard, which is to say this character is very dishonorable and is significantly more likely to start hostile schemes, abuse their position as regent, send blackmail, use the fine secrets council task, withhold hostages, and betray their friends and spouses. Not the nicest brother, unfortunately. So we're going to have to kind of keep an eye on him. How are we going to keep an eye on him? Well, let's talk about the council. So one of the comparisons that comes to mind a lot when I talk to people about the kind of game that CK3 is, this is like Game of Thrones the game in a lot of ways. And there are actual mods that allow you to play on Game of Thrones map as opposed to on a real world map. And the reason you say it's Game of Thrones the game is that, of course, you can just have lots of intrigue, you can have lots of inappropriate activities between siblings. It can just go down some dark rabbit holes really quickly. Also, lots of just general assassination and murder and plotting of all kinds. And one of the ways that you exercise power in CK3, much like the characters in Game of Thrones exercise power, is through their councils. Through the people that are closest to them that wield the most power in their kingdoms or in their territories. So we have five counselors. Now we can't actually replace the archbishop because we're Catholic and the Catholic kind of this archbishop, this particular, the technical name for this slot is the realm priest. But in this case, this is the archbishop appointed by the Pope. So we can't really do anything as far as replacing this archbishop, which sucks, frankly, because his learning skill is three, which is terrible for a priest. But it is what it is. However, we have our chancellor, who has a decent diplomacy. It's average, as you can see. And we have our steward, who has a decent level of stewardship. Our marshal is terrible with his particular marshal ability. Different word. Similar meaning. And our spy master, our lovely brother, Aid McKinnade, is average. So we have a very average council with a few definitive weak spots. Now the question is, what can we do to kind of get better people in some of these positions? Because there may be some things that we can do right away. First of all, I'm noticing that... Oh, interesting. So we could swap the steward and the chancellor. And my steward would then have a stewardship score of 10. And... Ooh, that wouldn't work well, though. For... <laughs> I just saw his diplomacy score. I was excited because that would make things slightly better there. So you can definitely, at the beginning of a game, you can make sure that your council is set up for success, which is what we're going to do. So we have... Interesting. So Comgol here, if I brought him down, he would be much better as our marshal than our current marshal would be. However, what would he do? Actually, yeah, this swap makes sense. So watch this. 12, 13. Boom. So now we have a better steward and a better marshal. And thankfully, because we just exchanged places, we didn't fire anybody. <laughs> so I haven't started off this game making one of my vassals slash ex-councilman, potential ex-councilman, hate me, which is a win. 
Now, who can we replace, if anyone? We could, if we wanted to, we could replace our brother. It's probably not a good idea, is it? And welcome now, with this exact moment, to the totally random, unpredictable, and immensely entertaining possibilities that can emerge in any given game, even any given episode of CK3. Just a hint of it for now, but there's this idea of, oh yeah, we just learned about this particular character. He's not very nice if we fired him from our council, and he's our brother, and he's also the most powerful vassal in the realm, by the way. That might not go over well. We maybe should keep him on the council, you know. Keep your friends and family close, but your enemies and family enemies even closer, as the saying goes. Let's see. We could fire him and replace him with my new concubine umbrella if we really wanted to start off petty, but we're, we're going to play it a little bit smarter than that. So that's our starting council. Now we can make some adjustments to what the starting council is sort of set up to do. We're going to have the marshal train commanders. We're going to have the steward increase development in Gowry, which is presently our capital. Now, let's hold court. Hey, it's the throne room. That reminds me, first things first, before we actually hold court, let's go ahead and set up the artifacts that we have on hand. The Stone of Scone. So this is an illustrious throne. And yes, by the way, everything that I'm doing right now, very important kind of first steps to take in any campaign. You don't have to do them in this order, but it's good to sort of cross all of your T's and dot all of your I's and make sure that you're getting familiar with your kingdom at the start of things. Even if you're an experienced CK3 player, there's always going to be a bit of chaos. There's always going to be a bit of, wait, what the hell's going on? Because you're meeting an entirely new family, an entirely new kingdom, an entirely new kind of set of relationships at the beginning of every single playthrough, assuming you play as different characters every time. So it's important just to take time and let that chaos settle and start to kind of make order of it, which is what we're doing. So the Stone of Scone is going to be our throne. And we're going to set up our dynasty banner there. And we'll set up the house banner here. And these are giving us small benefits to our prestige, renown, court grandeur, and courtly vassal opinion every month. These values are all represented up here. So we have a certain amount of monthly income. We have a certain amount of prestige coming in every month, which, as it builds up over time, will lead to a higher level of fame. Not for our dynasty in this case, but for the ruler. So this will reset, this level of fame will, will reset when Constantine II dies and is succeeded by whoever succeeds him at the time. But right now, our level of fame is established. And as that grows, we will progress towards distinguished. Piety has to do with faith. Our current level of devotion is dutiful. And then we will progress towards faithful as the game progresses. And this is our dynasty renown. We also earn a certain amount of renown every month. And you can kind of look at the tooltip and see what the breakdown is. And as our renown builds up, we will have a higher level of splendor, which means, as you can see, marrying into this dynasty will give people more prestige just by becoming part of our family, essentially. And also, rulers get a maximum of plus 35 long reign opinion. So what that means is that the longer you are in charge of a kingdom, the longer you live, the higher the bonus can become uh, that other players have in terms of their opinion of you, not other players, but other characters have in terms of their opinion of you, if that makes sense. If you're newer as a dynasty, then even if you're alive for a really long time, if you've done enough to kind of piss your realm off, you might have trouble holding onto the throne. People will try to kill you, they'll try to scheme against you, and that's where navigating the gameplay of CK3 can get really spicy really fast, and also just very unpredictable. Okay, so almost done with some of the basic starting steps. Let's go ahead and develop the capital. This is an ability that we have because we are diligent. I dream that St. Johnson will one day be the envy of every ruler under the sky. I must endeavor to be the champion who turns it into the jewel of the earth. All that is needed is for me to put in some more work. So development growth in realm capital plus 0 0.20 per month. So let's go ahead and do that just to help with development. Now, I don't, I could go down the rabbit hole of what exactly development is right now, but without going into too much detail, let it suffice to say that it is kind of what it sounds like. Right now, if you look at this, 
Let's see if there's uh, any kind of legend for it. Not particularly, but you can see that there are certain areas of the map that are purple and certain areas of the map that are more golden. The areas that are purple are undeveloped. The areas that are golden are developed. And the higher your development, the more money you can make from ruling over that particular realm because it's just wealthier, more developed territory. So the higher we increase our development, the more potential our territory will have for the remainder of the game. So we've just basically told our entire or not our, our entire kingdom, but our entire capital county, Gowrie, that we would like that particular territory to be improved in terms of its development, which will spill over into neighboring territories as well. So, one of the core concepts of Crusader Kings 3, and by the way, if this seems like a lot, it's supposed to be. There's no real way to present the beginning of CK3, especially to a new audience, without it feeling like a hell of a lot. So having hopefully reassured you with that, one of the most important mechanics to understand in Crusader Kings is something that was also explained, I think is pretty much explained in the beginning of any new CK2 or CK3 series, which is the concept of de facto versus de jure. So this is also, colloquially speaking, there are so many different pronunciations of this that go around in the community. Um, there's the popular one that, that people will use is they'll say de jour, which is not technically the right pronunciation, but it's one of those things where so many people use it that it's kind of accepted, especially within the CK2 and CK3 communities. But we're going to go with de jure as the pronunciation of it. What do those terms mean? So this is, I guess, one of the things that makes CK3 very different from a game like Stellaris. So one thing that Paradox games do kind of have in common across the board, including Stellaris. Like, if you're at war with another player, you might see that, or just another nation, not necessarily another person you're playing with, but if you're at war with another country, you might see that, for example, this county could have bars over it at one point, which indicates that that county is under occupation by an invading party. And the more counties you occupy, the more likely you are to be able to win the war and force the person you declared war on to sort of accept your terms. The same thing can happen in Stellaris. So you can occupy systems, right? Now, what you occupy at the end of the war, this is where it's very different from games like, say, Total War. What you occupy at the end of the war doesn't necessarily get turned over to you when the war is won. It's all, all the occupations and assaults that take place are just for the sake of fighting the war which has a declared objective in advance. You might say that you want to conquer a particular county. So if we were going to conquer this county, which we might very well do shortly, by the way, if we're going to conquer this county, what we could do is declare and say, we want to conquer this county. That county should be ours. And that's our war objective. And then we could literally, like every single castle you see on the map here could be occupied and sieged and just generally held by the kingdom of Alba. And if that happened, then it would be very likely that this particular opponent would surrender. And when he surrendered, we wouldn't get every single occupied city, except in cases where the particular type of war declaration allowed for that. Most of the time, all you would get is the enemy ruler saying, okay, you win, you can have your war objective, and this territory would change hands. So that's one very important concept. Now, over time... What that begins to sort of change is, well, what is the kingdom of Alba exactly? What is part of it and what isn't part of it? So when you look at the de jure kingdom map, check this out. This is what we currently own. This is the de facto map at present. This is the basic map mode. So this is every realm in existence, not necessarily every realm that can possibly exist, but every realm in existence. Alba, by right, when you look at the kingdom map, extends across all of this territory here, close to Hadrian's Wall, which is right there. If you were wondering if it was on the map, yes, it's there. I knew someone was going to ask, so I might as well just beat you to the punch. There's Hadrian's Wall. So, we have a claim, because we're the king of Alba, and Alba, by right, should be... All of this, we have a claim on all territory within this. That is called a de jure claim. And that's one of the things that really sets CK3 apart, even from a game like Stellaris. Because what you can say is, 
this is the territory we have, but this land has history. And this long, this land belongs to us. It should be ours. So Alba has a right as a country to fight for this land with their claim, with their casus belli, their rule for war, their reason for war, being that they have a right to rule this territory. Once, they're, once they've kind of hit this limit, then they're going to have a little bit of a harder time with that. Now, there are ways if you hold on to particular sections of the map for long enough, what is considered de jure does what's called drift. So there is a concept of like, if you hold on to territory long enough for centuries, then this the simulation will consider new sections of territory, de jure Alba or de jure England. And the same is true for what should be de jure part of an empire or part of a kingdom or a duchy. Are you starting to get a sense of just how complex <laughs> CK3 is? It's delightful, but it's also overwhelming when you first play. So, by the way, if I didn't say this early on, and now that I think about it, I definitely didn't. Questions are absolutely welcome, not only during the premiere, but also just in the comments. Like, if there are things that aren't clear, if you're trying to learn, not only would I be happy to answer them, but also I'm sure there are lots of community members who know the same about CK3 or more about CK3 than I do. So, by all means, jump in and offer some thoughts on that. So, having said that, that's one of the key things. It's just understanding that there's the territory you control... But then there's the territory you should control by right, and that gives you the ability to wage certain wars. Now, I think we might actually unpause. I didn't think it was going to happen, but I think we might actually unpause. I have a certain amount of gold. I could build some stuff in some of the territory I control. So as the king, I have three holdings to my name right now. I have three titles... I mean, I have the Kingdom of Alba as a title, but then I also have Gowrie, Angus, and the Marins. And I can build things in all of them, but we're not going to do that just yet because we don't have a lot of gold income. However, one thing we can do, well, let's hold court first and foremost. We need to do this. Do some kingly things, and then maybe we'll start a war at the beginning. The more you can conquer in the beginning of a game to sort of use the existing claims that you have and push back against things that could go wrong later the better. In order to be a successful ruler, I must actually rule on the various dilemmas and situations which arise within my sphere of influence. So, this is just going to cost 50 prestige. Let's hear our petitioners. Sitting on my throne, I gesture for my guards to open the doors of the hall. A stream of people file in, some lining up in front of my throne while others move out of the way so they can simply observe the proceedings. After several moments, all movement in the chamber has ceased. All faces turn towards mine expectantly. In front of me, I count three petitioners, there are always just three, lined up in an orderly row, waiting for me to call on them. Gesture for the first in line to approach. Or you can say, screw it, <laughs> and just not hold court. That's one of the fun things about CK3, by the way. Like, your character has traits, right? And there are actually mechanics in place that reward you for playing according to your character's traits. Like, what would a ruler that is arbitrary do versus a ruler do that's diligent? What is the difference there? And it actually causes stress levels to build up faster for certain characters, which can cause mental breaks and all kinds of trouble. Again really robust kind of family and personality simulations happening across the board in CK3. In a brief moment of silence, I see Mormer Malmure tapping his foot before realizing that it's his turn to speak. My liege, he says, giving him some precious time to finalize his thoughts before continuing. Smiles and laughter are a great indicator of a lively court. Thus, I have a suggestion for someone who would make a great jester to entertain us who could come to visit. My liege, if I may, Mormer Comgol speaks up from the sidelines, a jester will ruin the sophisticated air of this court, and replace its refinement with crude, infantile humor. Okay. So we can say, this is not a peasant's market. A jester has no place in court. We would gain the austere court modifier for five years. That would reduce, and this, by the way, that would be a modifier on me, the king. So it would reduce my diplomacy and increase my learning. So basically kind of siding with Comgol, if you will. I would also get a opinion penalty for Melmure and gain 20 opinion from Comgol for basically siding with him. 
And there is the possibility that I could form a rivalry with the person I've basically just shut down. But I could say, perhaps I'll look into this some other time. Now, there can also be options to actually appoint a jester here, but I think because it's the beginning of the game and we're getting this event right away, it's not presenting those right now. So let's say this is not a peasant's market. A jester has no place in this court. My lord, my steward, Mormo Driston, speaks up. I propose a cadastral survey of all counties you own. Improved knowledge and mapping of your land will certainly increase its prosperity. All right, so we can spend 75 gold, which we have. Driston starts working on the cadastral survey. It will take several months to be completed. Or we could say maps are overrated, and he would not be happy about that. So this is, again, my steward who's proposing this change. Let's go ahead and give him that gold. A thin, raggedy peasant stands before me, gawking at the opulence of my throne room. Obviously distracted, I call him to get his attention. Oh, I'm sorry, my lord. I, uh, my village in Gowry was hit by blight this year. We lost not only our crop, but our seed, too. We have nothing. We shall, sir we shall starve without help. Glancing around my throne room again, he adds, Surely you have wealth to spare. You will have the funds you need to rebuild, we could say that, which will provide court grandeur to me, as well as a bonus in terms of popular opinion and a reduction of danger for five years. Or we can say your service will repay your debt, which means... Interesting. Ooh. So we could have more development growth and faster building construction as well as cheaper building construction. Or we could say, if the fields are barren, you shall wield a sword. Plowshares to sword. The farms of this county lay empty, their tenants enlisted to fight instead of sow. Levy size, plus 20%. Holding taxes, minus 20%. Danger, minus 5. Okay, so that would reduce the money that I make from this particular province, which is my capital. But it would increase the levies that I gain from it and reduce the danger. I think I kind of like the first option the most because of the popular opinion boost. So let's go for that. We've got the money for it. It's going to put us slightly in debt for like a month, but it's fine. My business here is done, and we've held court for the first time. This is, by the way, the Royal Court expansion for CK3. So if you buy CK3 vanilla and don't have Royal Court, you won't actually have that particular choice available to you. Now, I am in debt, and the game's giving me advice about that. I'm going to ignore that advice. <laughs> And we're going to continue taking care of some other starting steps. So we do need a physician. A couple of other things to take care of here. Let's go ahead and give the order to search for a physician. There are other decisions I could make here. I could convert to the local culture. I could invite claimants. I could invite champions. Inviting claimants is exactly what it sounds like. You just generally put out a call and say, Hey, if you think like this particular tract of land should be yours i uh if you show up at my court i might maybe asterisk uh help you claim it i might do that maybe so come on over that's exactly what it is and so it's just kind of a roll of the dice and if someone shows up with a really nice claim especially if you are in charge of a larger kingdom or empire then you can use those people as a way to get certain territories within your particular uh, borders sooner than later we could also search for a caravan master and a wet nurse. I'm not going to worry about that just yet. However, I do think we need to set... All right, so Donal has a diplomacy education focus. I'm okay with that. Donal right now is a covetous blackguard. So again, he's arbitrary and he's charming. He certainly knows how to wrap people around his little finger. He is sweet and amiable, which allows him to get away with almost anything. Okay, let's do the unthinkable. <laughs> As we approach the end of the first episode, let's unpause. I know, I know, I know. It's the first episode we're unpausing. What's the matter with me? Oh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We can't unpause yet. We can't unpause yet because, because there's something else to do. <laughs> uh, we're going to go ahead and forbid all of our important characters from being knights in a war. Because we might well be in a war within a few moments. And I don't want to lose a character that I really need to be alive so we're going to forbid all of them that you can see there. Now, unfortunately, this does mean that we are down several champions. We could also create an accolade, which I'll probably do quite soon. Maybe not in this episode. But let's go ahead and unpause. Court grandeur level increased. Nice. I'm honored by your request, and I would be glad to call you an ally. Remember that we arranged an alliance while we were paused. We did a lot while we were paused. That's the beginning of any CK3 campaign. With our brother, 
Marvelous Luna. So that has improved his opinion of me because we're, well, we are siblings, but also since we're allied now, that will help. Now, King Charles of West Francia has just allowed his daughter to wed me. So, oh, interesting. We've already found a potential court physician and we have multiple options. So I'm going to kind of choose the expedient route here rather than looking at all four characters. And I want to see if there's one. Okay. La Sofiona is widely known in scholarly circles. Apologies in advance for any mispronunciations of things. I will try my best to do my Scottish ancestry proud, but I don't live in Scotland. So feel free to correct me and educate me and or anyone else that's curious on the pronunciation of things. It's always a fun discussion to have. Makes me think of the, um, the old, uh, Poland series in Civ 6, which is a fond memory of mine on the channel. Anyway, let's see. Let's go with the excellent court physician. Wedding celebration with my marriage to Queen Ermintrude, not a princess anymore, Queen Ermintrude, the lustful. The realm expects us to throw a suitably extravagant wedding celebration. It is well within my right to collect a royal aid duty as part of this, but some may consider it tasteless to levy an extra tax during a time of jubilation. So we have a choice here. Of course I will collect it. Who pays for their own wedding? This would help my debt problem. Or I could gain prestige. I think in most games, I would choose this one just for the free 350 prestige out of the gate. I'll let my subjects enjoy the festivities without worry or care. But I'm going to go ahead and play the arrogant side of Calcentine the second a little bit. Also because I need the money. So of course I'll collect it. Who pays for their own wedding? Okay, now let's pause for just a moment because, again, if we go back to the de facto map, this is the territory we actually control. This is the territory we could control. This is what we actually control. Let's take a quick look at this guy here. If we were to declare on this character, he's actually pretty strong right now in this save, which is less than ideal. Once he allies with anyone else, he'll be even stronger. So this number here, 6,831, is the number of total soldiers that we could have on our side. Now that includes our allied troops. So these numbers always show you the total number of troops that could possibly show up in a fight should you choose to start one. He slightly outnumbers me. He doesn't have any allies right now, but even with allies, I'm slightly outnumbered by the guy. That's a problem. It's going to make the beginning of this particular series uh, pretty spicy. Now, Petty King Artgul is a little bit more on the meager side. So we could go ahead and declare a war on him just to take a little bit of territory. We could also, just to give you a bit of a tease for what's to come, we could make an incursion into Northumbria at the beginning of the game here. So if we declare on Northumbria, also no allies, we're vastly superior to them in terms of the number of forces that we have. Eventually, we want this particular city for reasons that shouldn't need to be explained. Look in the bottom left or look in the tooltip if you want. We want that city to be our capital. If we're going to be Scotland, we got to have Edinburgh. So that's the decision that I'm probably going to go with. If I go ahead and just conquer that right out of the gate, that would be a good way to kind of get off on the right foot. I do have to keep an eye on our good friend, the Suthrayar, though. So, um... Ooh! They're already at war. Check that out. So, it looks like Northumbria starts off at war with the Suthrayar. Was not expecting that. That changes my opinion of whether I want to actually attack them now. Here's what we'll do. Let's let things run for just a second. You can designate a guardian for your son. Oh, hold on. That's what I didn't do. We gave him an education focus, but we didn't actually arrange to, for him to be properly raised. Sorry, kiddo. We'll, we'll get, up, get right on that. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're not employing a wet nurse. Probably a good idea to have a wet nurse employed. Our court physician could also be our wet nurse. 
She's loyal. That's good. She's an herbalist, physician, mastermind philosopher. Honestly, that's pretty good. She's lazy, trusting, compassionate, but mastermind philosopher. You know what? Let's do it. It costs us a little bit in terms of monthly income right now. You want to be careful with how many things you kind of do to chip away at your uh, income, not only in terms of your gold, but prestige, piety, renown, all these things at the beginning of a particular playthrough because there are so many things that can kind of pile up quickly while your kingdom is relatively small. But let's take a closer look here. Yeah, see, now we actually have more troops than him by a slight amount. So if we unpause for a moment. See, now it's actually going down. And the reason it's going down is, I believe, raiding that's happening in neighboring territories. Or it's possible that one of these... Oh, what it might be is actually some of West Francia's troops might be dying. They might be involved in a war. So we have something going on here. Let's see here. Greetings, my impressive king, Lassar Fiona says, smiling warmly. I'm very interested in the upbringing of your son, Donald. You see, I speak Anglic, a language that I believe would be most useful for him to learn, she explains with a genuine tone. I just need coin for quills, ink, parchment, and some personal compensation, of course. Hmm... So we could basically spend a lot of money, which I don't have money. I've already gone into debt once this episode, so we're probably not going to do it twice. We can tell him to do his best, spending a little bit of money and kind of letting it be a roll of the dice. As you can see, there's a 64% chance that he would fail. There's a 36% chance that he would succeed. Or we could just say, no, Guadalic is all we need. Why would you want to learn any other language aside from Guadalic? That's, that's absurd. How dare you suggest that? That's a stupid idea. Uh, I think I'll go with the dice roll. He's stressed out. Okay, so he gained some stress. We tried to make him learn a language that he really couldn't learn under those particular circumstances. But it was the right call to make because I didn't have the money for it. So, let's take another look at this particular war. Because it's either this war that I fight now, or this one for Northumbria. This might be my only chance to take Edinburgh, especially if... What are you exactly fighting for? Let's find out. So it's just a general invasion. He's a vindictive villain. So it's a Norse faction that's kind of settled in this territory here. And what we... I believe it's Norse, I think. But this is during that particular time of history where you have a lot of, like, Viking mix in this area. So, what we need, I believe, if you played Assassin's Creed Valhalla, you know what I'm talking about. Because clearly that is the arbiter of all things historically accurate, right? Right. No arguments to the contrary. Let's go ahead and declare war. Interesting, it looks like... Oh no, okay, so that ruler's still alive. We're gonna conquer... The Earldom of Lothian, which contains the territory that will eventually be our capital. Let's declare. Raise all armies. Now, I'm not going to worry about actually calling anyone to the war. Because his armies are so small compared to mine that it's not going to be a big deal. I just want to make sure that I occupy this fully before anyone else does. Ooh, interesting. So we have some raiders from the Sufayar who are over here. And if we were to encounter them, it looks like we might actually have to call the king. Right now, he will not accept. Interesting, tar interesting start to the series here. Let's go ahead and... It's not a great chance for swaying him, but I'm going to need to do that. I need his opinion to be higher so that he'll come and join these wars. This is exactly what I was talking about with regard to the chaotic starts of these series. There's so much that can kind of go differently every single time you play. Commander promoted. Interesting. So, Pedrick. 
Oh, decent. Very well, Pedrick shall serve me. I do need other knights at the moment, so let's take a moment to see if I can recruit anyone else. Yep, recruit to court. Recruit to court. Just to make sure we have the appropriate number of champions. There we go. Six of seven champions there. We want to make sure that we have that number filled out. But yeah, there's so much that can kind of go differently. I went with the option of having the stronger start to the dynasty by having a lustful wife, but mm, that could backfire. Ah, the cadastra is completed. Remember the survey that we arranged during our first visit with court? Development progress increases by 35. Warmer Dristan gains 75. You gain 150. Prestige. Gold well spent. So we got some prestige for that at least. It looks like the invading army is withdrawing, interestingly enough. Okay, we have another raiding army landing elsewhere. I'm not exactly sure what they plan to do. Okay, good. They're mostly avoiding me. As long as I get this territory and can end my war without running into them, I'll be happy about it. His chance to accept is improving, but I'll have to keep an eye on that. What? <laughs> this event actually fires pretty often at the beginning of this campaign. I've had it happen in several runs over the past month or two while I've been learning more about this start. And I think it even happened, I think it's been happening for a while, to tell you the truth, because I remember this happening more than a year ago, in fact. But yeah, in case you missed it, we just randomly got gifted Excalibur. <laughs> so that's a thing that happened. And that's a royal court artifact. There we go. Giving us extra prestige, renown, knight effectiveness, court grandeur. All of those bonuses, their utility will become more obvious kind of as we progress in the series. But I think that's a pretty good, hilarious ending note for the first episode. We could keep going here for a good while, but then we would never have an episode two. I guess one thing we could do is let this siege finish. Notice that the siege is going to be done in a little bit over a month. Now, when we actually finish taking control of Edinburgh, that doesn't mean that we'll win the war. It just means that the war score will swing in our favor. Now, that is definitely language that my Stellaris viewers in particular will appreciate. Even if you've never played CK3 before. So we have control of Lothian, and now we have a plus 16% war score. So we still have more to do if we want to encourage them to actually let us win this war and keep Edinburgh. So we may still have to find a way to get West Francia involved. His acceptance is particularly low at the moment, so it's a pretty spicy start. As we continue to progress, one of the things that I'm going to need to do is try and catch this guy with his defenses down. Notice his troop count has dropped slightly relative to what it was earlier. So if I could time things correctly, I might be able to declare on him and then essentially over the course of an episode or two, just take complete control of this territory here. That's one advantage of this particular character. Because they're a different culture than us, we have the ability to just declare war and say, hey, I have a right to all that land. Give me that in this particular case. So that's probably something I will try to do if I can time it correctly. But the problem is if he gains allied troops, then that presents a little bit more of a challenge going forward, and we'll have to keep an eye on that. For now, I'll go ahead and wrap up this first episode. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to follow along. If you're not new here, look for the join button to get access to channel unique emotes, badges, and other perks. New episodes drop every day but Tuesday at 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time, and comments are always welcome, so leave your thoughts below, and I'll see you next time.